Good evening. These days we're preparing for Shavuos, Zman Matan Teirusenu, and as you know, one of the customs on Shavuos is to learn and read Megillus Rus, the book of, of Rus, one of the 24 Svarim of the Tanakh, one of the Chamesh Megillah is one of the five scrolls which is learned and read on Shavuos. Some Kehillahs read it even with a bracha. Many Kehillahs read it on the second day Shavuos without a bracha. Some learn it, say it in Tikkun El Shavuos. And the connection between Rus and Matan Torah Shavuos is discussed in many Svarim. There are numerous, a few dozen reasons that are given in Svarim about the connection between Rus. Megillahs, Rus and Shavuos the most famous one is that it uh, discusses the chronology, the Yichus of David. Hamelech, whose great-grandmother was Rus, of course, and uh, he passed away on Shavuos. Another major theme is Rus's conversion to Judaism from uh, being a Moavite woman, a Moavite princess, to becoming a Jew. And uh, Matan Torah was the time when Klal Yisrael experienced a collective and individual conversion into Jewishness, into Jewish identity. And many other reasons that are given in Svarim in the connection of Rus to Shavuos. But tonight I want to briefly discuss one scene in Rus. In the first chapter of Rus, it's a profoundly moving scene. Even as we read it and learn it every year, it doesn't stop to stir our hearts when we discover the commitment, the loyalty that Rus displays to her, towards her mother-in-law and uh, towards the Jewish people, notwithstanding the availability to move on with life. The story, briefly, everybody knows, Elimelech was a Jew who lived in Beis Lechem, and he deserted his people, he moved from Ephrat from Beis Lechem, in near, near, near Yerushalayim to Zde Moav, to the fields of Moav, Moav in the in the east in the Jordan today, in the eastern side of the Jordanian River. He and his wife Naomi and their two uh, sons Machlon and Kilion. Elimelech unfortunately dies, and his two sons intermarry. They marry two Moavite women, Rus and Orpa. There is an argument among the commentators if they first converted them or did not convert them. The consensus is that they did not convert them, at least not fully, which is why later on Naomi tries to persuade both of them to go back to the Moabite culture and way of life because they were not Jewish. So why bother with a people whose uh, destiny and fate is complicated and complex, whose commitments are profound. Sadly, after 10 years, Machlein and Kilian also die. So their mother, who has been a widow, is alone with her two daughters-in-law, uh, Rus and Arpa. And at this point, Naomi hears that the famine in Eretz Yisrael, which has initially caused her husband to desert his people, has ended and she decides to go back to uh, Beis Lechem. She tries to persuade both of her daughters-in-law to go back to their parents' home, to find a life of serenity, of tranquility. She thanks them, she blesses them with much grace and blessings. She kisses them and she weeps, they all weep. But they insist that they want to return with her to her nation, to the Jewish people. Naomi puts up a profound and heavy argument. She says it doesn't make sense. What are your chances of rehabilitating your life? I don't have any more children whom you can marry. I'm an old woman. I can't get married anymore. I'm not going to have children. Even if I would be able to have children, are you going to wait for that? So you're going to come from Moab to a new people that you don't know. You're going to have to... Try to find a relationship, a marriage. It's going to be very, very difficult psychologically, emotionally, sociologically, culturally, financially, spiritually. We could understand somewhat Naomi's argument to Rus and Arpa. I have a bitter life. God has struck me, she says. You move on, you young woman. You have a future ahead of you in Moab. Go back to your nation. Go back to your culture. 
they cry again. And at this point, Arpa has been persuaded to leave. Vatishak Arpa Lachamosa. Arpa kisses her mother in law. But Virus Dafkaba. Rus cleaved to Naomi. And Naomi says, Your sister in law has just returned to her nation and to her God, the pagan God of Moavai, of Moab. You too. And Rus says, No. Don't beseech me to abandon you. Presenting those mortal words. Wherever you go, I will go. Basher Talinialin, wherever you dwell, I shall dwell. Amich, Ami, Ve'elekayich, Elekoy. Your nation is my nation, your God is my God. Basher Tamusi Amos, wherever you die, I will die. Vesham Mekaveh. And there I will be buried. Kayasa Hashem Livi Chayosif, Kiyamavis Yafrid Beini Uvenei. Holy death will separate you from I. And when Naomi observes this extraordinary commitment of Rus, she ceases to convince her to return, and they go together to Beis Lechem. And as you know, the continuation of the story, the very moving story, ultimately, Rus will end up marrying Boaz and giving birth to a dynasty from where David HaMelech, Shleim HaMelech, and ultimately Melech HaMashiach, will emerge from. But I want to focus tonight not on Rus, I want to focus on Arpa, the one who didn't make it to Beis Lechem, the one who went back. When you read the Psukim, literally you think that's the end of Arpa's story. But of course, Chazal, who are forever sensitive to nuance, explore untold layers of meaning and significance behind Arpa story. In Divrei Hayamim, we discover Arpa's children. And we discover that one of Arpa's children is a person who will become quite familiar to us in the Tanakh in Shmuel Aleph, Perik in Zion, a man named Goliath. Goliath, who combats David HaMelech in the public arena. Shmuel Aleph, Perik in Zion. Shem Mishol is the king and the Philistines are targeting and abusing and persecuting the Jewish people. And when there's a readiness for war, Goliath, a mighty, muscular, powerful man, giant, goes out of the team and he faces the Jewish people and he says, forget army to army, let's go man to man. Choose one man, Bruli Yishach, and let him fight me. Let us battle, let us wrestle each other and... If he defeats me, we become your slaves. And if I defeat him, you, the Jewish people, become the slaves of Plisht. Forty days. Babaykir and Be'erev in the morning and in the evening. Forty days. Goliath faces the Jewish people and challenges them to a point where they are terrified, overwhelmed, broken, uncertain what will be the future. 40 days where he's mocking them, he's enticing them, he's scoffing at them, and not just at them, at Hashem, at their God, at what the Jewish people represented. And finally, young, handsome, but much shorter, David takes on Goliath. Shaul Amalek tries to dress him with a sword, but David says, I have no experience with the sword. Instead, he takes his little rocks his rocks, his stones, and he puts them in Yalkut Aroyim, in his sash for shepherds, with his sling, and he confronts Goliath, Goliath, who's outraged, what am I, a dog, that you're coming to me with sticks? Goliath can believe that David HaMelech would take him on, not with a sword. And that famous, powerful exchange between Goliath and David HaMelech, recorded in the Tanakh, where Goliath curses David, and curses David's God, and David finally tells him, you may be coming to me through physical, with physical weapons, with a sword and a spear, etc. I'm coming to you in the name of God. Hashem And this goes on for days until 
David HaMelech takes on the Goliath. Vayishyatsev Arboyim Yoyim, as I said, Goliath approaches 40 days till David HaMelech takes on Goliath. And with the sling, he shoots a stone which hits Goliath's forehead and kills him. Goliath was the son of Arpa, the sister-in-law of Rus. David, of course, was a grandson of Rus. So this confrontation between David and Goliath is seen in the eyes of Chazal as profoundly significant. To the point that Chazal tell us on the post. Vatishak Arpa Lachamaisa Virus Dovkaba Arpa kissed her mother in law and Rus cleaved her to her. Amir Yitzchak, Mesechta Sai to Dafman Beis Amid Beis, Amir Yitzchak, Amir Akadish Baruch Hu Yavayu Bneyana Shuka Vayiplu Biyat Bneyat Vuka. Let the children of the woman who was kissed come and be defeated by the children who were Kali, who cleaved on, who connected to Naomi. Because Arpa is Vatishak Arpa Lachamais. Bnei Anashuka will be defeated by Bnei Hatvuka. Zakt Rashi, what's wrong with being kissed? She kissed Arpa, she loved Arpa, because she kissed her to separate from her rather than converting. Versus Rus, who remained, who became a Jewess. Hence the superiority of Rus's choice over Arpa's choice. Yavoyu. What does this mean? What is the significance of this? After all, Naomi was persuading Arpa to leave. She didn't want Arpa to come along. Rus too. She wanted Rus to follow Arpa. Rus insisted to remain. What is this? A penalty? As though Arpa did something wrong, Arpa is weeping, Arpa is kissing, Arpa is saying goodbye. Arpa wants to come, but her mother-in-law stages a good argument, so she finally leaves. Rus is stubborn. As though the Neshuka was doing something wrong, on the contrary, we see much dignity and grace in the behavior of Arpa. She wasn't ready for Rus's sacrifice. Her own mother-in-law did not even want Rus to sacrifice. What do we want from Arp? The Gemara in Mesech Tesoite, there some, says something else too. Why did the Plishti come in the morning and at night? He wasn't just trying to fight a war. He wanted to nullify the Jews. He did not want to allow them to say Krishna in the morning and at night. So right in the morning and at night, when they were about to begin Shema Yisrael, he stood and he began spewing threats, hatred, and curses against the Jew and their God. Why are boyim yoyim forty days? Corresponding to the forty days which Torah was given. What's the connection? Torah was given in forty days from Vav Siv until Yudzai and Tamil. When Moshe came down and saw the calf and broke the luchas, he was 40 days on the mountain. Because of those 40 days, Goliath stood 40 days. So we have the Ma'alach of Rashi, we have the Ma'alach of the Marsha. The perspective of the Marsha is Zeluyumaz. Every force in holiness has an equal force in the antithesis of holiness. So just as Torah had the power of 40 days, Goliath had the power of 40 days. Rashi has another approach. As the Marsha concedes that it's a different approach, Rashi Tainis. Corresponding to the 40 days during which Torah was delayed to be received by the Jewish people. It took 40 days, it was delayed, it was postponed for 40 days. That delay gave Goliath the power to confront the Jew for 40 days. They procrastinated 40 days, so to speak. That power was given to him. He took that power. He absorbed that power. Then there's the old famous Chazal in Medrash and other places, Medrash Ruz. Why 40 days? Because Arpa took 40 steps following Rus. When, well, following Naomi. When Naomi began to leave and went to Beis Lech, to go to Beis Lechem, Arpa, the daughter-in-law, followed her and took 40 steps. 
So Kenegit, corresponding to the 40 steps that she took following Naomi before she finally went back, because of those 40 steps, her son Goliath was given 40 days. Then we know the famous Gemara, Mesech Tosayt, Tosad of Mbeza, Mbeza, about the tears. The Gemara says, Dorash Rove, Bishar, Arba, Dmoyes, Shirid, Orpal, Chamoisa, Zachsu, Biyotsum, and Arba, Giboir. Because of the four tears that Arpa shed for her mother in law upon saying goodbye, she married its four mighty sons. Shinemar, Vatisena, Koila, Vatifkena, Oi. Four mighty sons because of the four tears. What is the meaning of this? One of the explanations is that in Arpa we have to understand a major battle erupted. And here is the principle in life. The struggles that exist in the hearts of parents will be bequeathed to children. The unresolved points of tension and conflict vibrating in the psyche of mother and father will naturally be transmitted to the lives of their children, which is why it is so important that we, those of us who are here with us, who are parents, should work on themselves. Each one of us to deal with our unresolved tensions, with our mistakes, our errors, those elements in us that we haven't dealt with. Those flaws, those negative attributes, those uh, challenging characteristics that are unresolved, we have to deal with them. Because if not, our children will have to deal with them. Just as some of us must deal with unresolved dimensions of our parent psyche. And all the way back. Until we always blame Chava for eating from the Eitz Adas, of course. You can always tell your therapist, it's not me, it's Chava's fault. She ate from the tree, what do you want from me? Arpa had a major struggle. Arpa was torn between two worlds. On one hand, she sensed the richness of spirit that existed in the heart of Naomi. On the other hand, she was drawn to the rich and royal and wealthy and pagan lifestyle of Moab. As we know, Rus and Arpa Chazal tell us were descendants or children of Eglay and Melech Moab, descendants of Balak. They were aristocracy, they were royalty. So on one hand, she sensed the glory, the inner spiritual glory of the world of Naomi. And she was drawn to it. But on the other hand, she was overtaken by the opportunities of Moyov. And this conflict had some very powerful consequences. She said to Naomi, I'm going with you. But ultimately, she could not get herself to abandon her God and her nation. As Naomi told Ruth, your sister-in-law went back to her nation and her God. She left. She kissed, she wept because she was torn, she was dichotomized. She left. And all her, all her life, she thought, what if? What if? And this conflict went over to her child, Goliath. And because this conflict went over to her child, Goliath, it was he who was perturbed by Yiddishkeit and by the Jewish people more than any other plishti. His standing up to Eliké Yisrael, his standing up to David HaMelech, his standing up to Klal Yisrael, was not because of he, not because of his detachment. On the contrary, so had geburit to them. His conscience was vibrating with him, within him. He felt tremendous conflict between the call of ideology and of morality and of ethics and of truth that Elikei Yisrael represents versus the hedonistic world of what Plishtim represented in that pagan era. And Goliath, in order to assuage his pain, 
in order to remove, to fill the void, in order to eliminate the guilt, needed to once and for all prove that Khalila less dimbel as dying, there's no such a thing as a Lekai Yisrael Khalil. He needed to prove that the Jewish people could be crushed and defeated and nullified, or at least subjugated. He needed to prove that a Lekai Yisrael has no standing. He needed to prove that what David represents is null and void, more than everybody else, because Arpa was, because Arpa was restless in one way, and Goliath was so restless in another way. So two things we learn. Number one, our challenges we give over to our children. Number two, when we see rebelliousness, we have to often be able to see beyond the rebelliousness. Sometimes the rebelliousness is not a symptom of detachment, but often of attachment. The pain and the anxiety from the alienation is causing such an intense reaction in the soul of the child. And this is the story of Goliath, and this is al Hasidus, what the Chazal are trying to intimate. And this is the Pshat, that Peshchus of the 40 steps of, of Arpa, Goliath was given 40 days. It's not just quid per quo, 40 steps, 40 days. It's much deeper. The 40 steps of Arpa represented the other side of her. It represented her willingness, her desire, her yearning to be attached to Naomi, to, and hence to be attached to Torah, and hence to be attached to mitzvahs. That's what it represented. So the way it translated in her son's life was, in a different way, in a different incarnation, but the same concept. You're looking at him and he's standing 40 days in the morning and in the evening, cursing, scoffing, spewing curses and hatred and negative energy, and he wants to destroy them. Essentially, these are the 40 steps of our book. Essentially, this is Goliath's way of saying, prove it to me. Or else I will prove that it doesn't exist. I can destroy it because his conscience was not letting him be tranquil. And hence he needed to nullify Kriyash Mashachris and Arvis. And these are the four tears that produce the, that produce the four Gibbardim. And this is the deeper meaning in the 40 days, connected the 40 days in which Torah was received. Because it's these 40 days in which Torah was received, these 40 days, this energy of each day that was haunting the Neshama of Goliath, which he needed to destroy in order to live a serene life and in order to be able to say, my choices are fine, my lifestyle is fine, I could finally be at peace. Arpa's choice was a good choice. And this is the deeper meaning of Vayu Bnei Aneshuka. It's not that Arpa was wrong for kissing Naomi. On the contrary, the Gemara is just describing on a deeper level the tragedy. Arpa's relationship with Naomi was they kissed, they had a connection, they had a relationship. But she couldn't commit. She couldn't become Davuk. She would kiss the truth, but not connect to the truth. And that's ultimately the difference between Arpa and Rus. There are people who are drawn, they feel a spiritualist urge, they feel a yearning. They know at least once a year or once in ten years that Hashem Melekim Emes. And that Hashem Hu Elekim Einoid Mulvade. And they want to kiss it. And they do kiss it. With tears in their eyes. They'll kiss it. But they're not ready to embrace it. They're not ready to become dovuk. They're ready for contact. They're ready for an emotional contact. They're ready for an inspiration represented by nishikin, by a kiss. Is dapkus ruche beruche, as the Tanya says. One spirit connects to another spirit. But vuka, to be able to say, Ameich, Amei, Velekayich, 
Barsha Tolini Yolun, Barsha Telchielech, Barsha Tomusi Yomus Vishome Kover, to be able not only to kiss, but to connect, to have the courage, that to know when you sense what is truth, to commit your life to it, to commit your soul to it, to commit your behavior to the Ratzin Hashem, to the will of Hashem Elikimem, as this takes a different type of courage. We like to touch, we like to kiss, we like to have the experience, but then to say goodbye. It was very nice while it lasted. And I'll come back next year for another kiss. Yavoyu b'nei hanashuka v'yiplu b'yad b'nei hatvuka. Orpo was the product of the neshuka. And when it's only a neshuka, then you can't expect the children to be able to really commit to it. Because the conflict in you, mame. The conflict in you, Tata, you may have kissed, but since you went away, the child is now torn between two worlds in a more powerful way. So the future of the Bnei Anashuka is quite impoverished in, pre- in the presence of the future of the Bnei Hadvuka. Rus, who connected herself, her children, brought David HaMelech to the world. Ne'im Zmir Yisrael who defeats Goliath. Arpa who just wanted the touch, who just wanted the sensual, emotional kiss. Ultimately, in her child, is a tremendous conflict. And he or she falls. Yiplu bi'al ne'ad And this is one of the messages in the connection of Rus to Matan Teira, to Shavuos, because when a Jew receives Teira, there's also there's the option of Arpa and there's the option of Rus. The option of Arpa is just to kiss Teira. Once in a while to be moved by Teira, to shed a tear for Teira, to have a good emotion about Teira. Comes Megillus Rus and tells us, Yavoyu bnei aneshuka v'yiplu biyat bnei atvuka. The challenge of the Jew is v'atam atveikim b'ashem alakeich. To commit himself or herself, heart and soul, to Teira to mitzvahs, to the Ratzin Hashem, to a relationship with our own inner soul. You can't just kiss your spiritual essence once a year or even once a day. You can't just touch your true essence once a year or once in ten years. One has to be able to have the courage and cultivate the maturity and the depth to become one with who they really are. Have a wonderful evening. A good Yom Tif. And as we wish in Chabad, Kabbalah Satayra, B'Simcha U'B'Pnimiyas. These are the two elements. Besimcha with joy, with passion, with enthusiasm, or bepnimius in a way that it becomes internalized within the person. Good night.